morning, would you just put, turn to your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 7, and we're going to be talking about, we're continuing our message series on the miracles of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. Last week, we talked about, the, well, the title of our message was, I Believe, and talking about believing God for the miraculous in our lives, and how God wants to do the miraculous. God wants to, wants to see the impossible become possible in your life, and so many times, we're faced with situations where they just seem so hopeless, it seems like there's no hope, but Jesus is the hope, Jesus is the answer, and Jesus makes the impossible possible in our life. And how we connect to the impossible and we connect to those things is through faith. But Jesus, time and time again throughout Scripture, we see how Jesus, whenever Jesus showed up, miracles happened. The supernatural took place and people's lives were changed. Souls were saved. Lives were changed by the power of God. And today we're going to be reading it through another miracle. The title of my message is Expect a Miracle. You know, we can expect miracles from God. And I believe as believers, as the body of Christ, as the children of God, we can live in anticipation that God is going to move in our lives, going to move in our situation. So many times we feel like we're alone in where we're at. We feel like we're the only one going through the situation that we're going through. We're the only one that, that experiencing the pain. We're, it just feels like we're all alone in the situation. And the beauty about being a child of God, the beauty about being in the body of Christ and being saved and redeemed is that we don't have to go through life on our own. We serve a powerful God that wants to move in our situations. He wants to see the, the works of the enemy. He has already destroyed the works of the enemy, the Bible says. He's come to destroy the works of the enemy, the Bible says. <laughs> that's all right we love crying babies around here it's all right it's all right amen 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 you know kids will never be counted as a nuisance around here we want our kids to be welcome they want our kids to feel like they're a part of who we are here and not second place and just another thing we're not we don't send them downstairs to get babysat or watch we get them we send them downstairs to be ministered to they're an investment, so I'm just so appreciative of all the kids that we have here at Church 180, and we get to invest in their lives. But God wants to move in our lives, and he wants, to, he wants to see those broken things in our lives restored. And sometimes it's difficult to really, because of the position, because of our circumstance, to really think that God really wants to move in our life. But he does. Now, we're going to read to you today... From, Matthew, from Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, where it says this, Now it happened after, the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him in a very large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. You ever have a situation just seem like everything was dead? It was a dead situation. It didn't seem like there was any hope, any life in that situation that you're in. And you felt like it was over. It was done. And a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. 
And this report about him went throughout all of Judea and all the surrounding regions. This was a situation that seemed hopeless. And I think that many of us have situations in our life that we wonder, are things going to get better? Are they going to change? You wonder, God, can you work with this now? Look how far gone it is. It doesn't seem like there's any hope. But this, 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 this situation definitely is in need of a resurrection. Because, God, I don't know what's going to happen in this situation. It's going to cause so much hurt, so much pain. And today I want to share three things I believe that we've got to do to really receive what God has for us in those situations. In those times that it seems hopeless, in those times when we need God to move in our family, to move in our child's life who's far from God, to move in our finances. Maybe we, we foreclose on a house or we experience bankruptcy. Maybe we're, we got mountains of debt that we just don't know how we're going to see it ever paid off. Maybe it's another hopeless situation. You're, you're sunk in the darkness of depression. You just don't know how you're ever going to see the light of day again. And three things I want to share with you today that help you receive the miracle that God has for you and to, to walk in, in victory in your walk with God. First of all, we need to pursue Jesus with expectancy. We've got to pursue him knowing that he is a miracle working God. He wants he is willing and able and wants to move in your life. There's nothing wrong on his end of everything. The Bible says that he's given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He's given to us every spiritual blessing. He says that he's given everything that's pertaining to life and godliness in this life. Everything that we need, God has already provided. And he's not broken. He's not just holding back on us. Saying, well, maybe I'll give it to you, or, you know, maybe you don't deserve it. You haven't been good enough. You know, you haven't been a good boy. You haven't been a good girl, you know. But we know that Jesus, that, 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 that he's willing and he's able to move in our life. It says in verse 11, it says, and now it happened. Another verse, it says, it says this, it says, that, and then it says, soon after this. In verse 4 in the book of Luke, if you look back, it looks, it looks at, it picks up on Jesus' ministry where we see that Jesus did some amazing things. First of all, he goes to the desert and he, and he fasts for 40 days where he's tempted by the devil. He comes back, though, in the power of the Spirit, and we see God do amazing things in people's lives. Miracles are happening. Demons are cast out. All these amazing things are happen, happening. In, in Luke chapter 6, before this, before this chapter 7 here, verse 6, it says that the Pharisees, they, they questioned Jesus one time and the disciples about, about, about picking food on the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath, breaking the law of, 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 of their, their man-made laws. They wanted to catch Jesus doing something wrong, and Jesus saw a man with a withered hand that day. And they wanted to see if he would heal the man on, on the Sabbath day to see if he would break their law, to break their rule. Jesus, knowing what they thought, he stretched out his hand and he healed the man with a withered hand. We read on about many miraculous things that happened, teaching that just astonished the people. It says that the multitude would even bring their, their sick and the demon possessed out to him so that they just might touch him. And all who came to him were made well, it says. It was miraculous. It was amazing. And seeing Jesus' willingness to bring restoration and healing into people's lives. In Luke 7, a man came to him. He said, I need you to heal my officer's son. Jesus said, let's go. Let's go heal him. And the officer and the, and the servant of the officer said, no, don't, we don't even have to go. All you've got to do is, is send the word and this young man will be healed. And Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith as I've seen in you. And the man was healed. So it's basically soon after these things, this is all that happened. So we pick up in verse 11. So after all of that, all these miraculous things, it says that there's a great crowd that followed him when all these things were happening. They were seeing the works of God. They were seeing the miraculous. They were seeing lives change. They were seeing great things that they've never seen before. And they traveled. They followed him everywhere that he went. Then it says, now it happened. After the day that he went into a city called Nain, 
and many of his disciples went with him, and a very large crowd. I mean, they saw the miracles. They're with Jesus. They saw all that he had done, saw the, 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 the lame walking again, the, the sick healed, the demon possessed, set free. And there's a genuine anticipation, there's a genuine excitement about what God was about to do. They lived in expectation. They, they had expectation that, that God's going to do something. They had eyewitnessed all that God has done, had, had done. I could only imagine that there was just a, a buzz in the crowd. Did you just see what he did? Wasn't that amazing? Did you see that guy who was lame and he, he's walking again? Did you see that person right there, that, that over there, that, that time when, when he was about to die, but he went over there and he, and he raised him up and he, he was delivered from his sickness? Did you see that guy rolling on the ground, frothing at the mouth, all possessed of the demon, and he delivered him and the guy was set free? I wonder what's going to happen next. What's God going to do next? And I believe as believers, we've got to live with the same kind of expectation in anticipation of what God is going to do. I believe we should come to church with that same kind of anticipation. We, could, we should come to church with that same expectation of, well, did you remember what God did last week where, where, where he moved in people's lives? I wonder what he's going to do this week. What is God going to do in my life? What's God going to do in the people's lives? What is God going to do? Can I get an amen in here? Amen. <laughs> Every believer should have a sense of anticipation. If we're coming to church, we're coming before God, and we're saying, we're saying, just, just, just I, I want to be entertained. I just want to see something. That's not what it's all about. It's about giving glory to God. It's about seeing him manifest himself in the lives of his people and seeing real life change happen. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of power. The Bible says that these signs shall follow those who believe. When the gospel is preached, powerful things happen. Every time Jesus preached, every time Jesus went places, lives were changed, miracles took place. And there's no question about that. There's only one time where he said he could only do a few miracles is because of their lack of faith. He was astounded at their lack of faith, actually, it says. But here with the man with the servant, it says that he was astounded by his great faith. And may we come to church every single Sunday. May we live our lives Monday through Saturday in expectation and in faith in God. Expectation of God moving in my life, expectation of God using me this week in the lives, in my workplace, in my family, in my neighborhood to communicate his love and his power to this lost and hurt world. And we drop down to verse 12, it says, And then he came near the gate of the city, and behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. So here we have two crowds. We have a big crowd following Jesus, and we have a big crowd following the lady who had lost her son. We've got this one crowd of anticipation, and then we've got this one other crowd of frustration, I'm sure. I want you to see this because I, I never really saw this and I think it's worth paying attention to. This large crowd followed Jesus. If you really think about it, they, I'm sure they're full of anticipation, expectation, full of faith. They thought Jesus could do just about any, Jesus could do anything to change any situation. We've seen it before our eyes. Then you've got this other crowd who's frustrated. The mother lost her son. It seems like a hopeless situation. And she may have been feeling frustrated because she may have been thinking to herself, like, you know, I, I prayed, he never got healed, nothing really happened. I was believing God, but nothing turned out the way that I thought that it would. 
How come I didn't receive my miracle yet? My, my son's dead, and I feel like I've lost everything right now, and I just feel so empty and lost. But then you've got this large crowd over here who they, they're seeing the dead raised. They're seeing the bodies healed. They're seeing lives changed forever, and they're full of faith and expectancy. And then you have this crowd over here who is mourning and frustrated and maybe filled with doubt. And maybe because of what they've gone through, cynicism. And I'm sure it's hard. It was hard for the mother. It was hard for this crowd. They were mourning. So you have this crowd following this funeral procession. And you have this crowd following Jesus. And they're about to collide. They're about to come together. So there's that procession of life with Jesus and the procession of death. And maybe people hear that maybe you're going through a, a tough situation. You're going through something that just seems so impossible. And man, it, it's carried, it, it, it's brought a lot of hurt. It's brought a lot of pain. It's brought a lot of frustration because things just aren't happening. You've been believing God. You've been praying. And it just seems like nothing is shifting. Nothing has happened. But I want to tell you right now, something is happening. God hears your prayers. He's working behind the scenes. And one day you will see an answer to your prayer. Faith is the substance of things unseen and the evidence of things. Faith. Faith. See, there's many reasons for frustration. Maybe somebody in your family died. Maybe you experienced sickness. Maybe it's the marriage that, that maybe it just, it just doesn't seem to, to, to be just, just, just being the healing like you thought that it should so that you can just get back to the way that things used to be. Maybe it's your job and you've just been really struggling and you're saying, God, when are you going to move me out of this job and that I can, I can walk into what I feel like you want me to do? And there's that sense of frustration. You see, if that crowd would only look up to see who was coming towards them, I'm sure the perspective would have changed. A lot of times we're feeling a certain way or going through a situation, become, become consumed by the situation that we're in. We're battling the situation, and our world all comes, it, it just seems to be all about what we're going through. It's about the debt you're trying to manage. It's about the, the marriage problem that you're going through. It's about your, your son or your daughter who's far from God, or it's about that sickness that you're in. And, and all that stuff becomes almost like an identity of who you are and a part of who you are. And you're always looking down at the situation that you're in. And, 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 you know, and, and if we'd only look up and we only trust in Jesus and take a look and, and worship him and praise him for all that he's done on the cross and what he wants to do in our life, our perspective would change. We put away the cynicism, the doubt, the negativity. See, cynicism, doubt, negativity, and even being a realist never got anybody a miracle from God. And never change the world, never change a thing. Faith. Faith in God changes everything. And some of us need to get out of that frustrated line and make that choice. It's a choice, you know. You can make a choice to get out of that frustrated line and get into this line of anticipation. Not saying your hurts aren't going to go away but you're positioning yourself differently to receive from God. Now I'm walking in faith. I'm positioning myself to receive from him. My situation doesn't always have to be the same. It's not a hopeless situation because of Jesus Christ who has overcome the world. Number two, we've got to trust in his word no matter what. It says in verse 13 that when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and he said to her, don't weep. It's a crazy thing to say at a funeral. She lost her son, and all of a sudden Jesus is coming up to her and saying, hey, don't weep. Of course I'm going to cry. My, my son just died. It seems like a, a totally ridiculous thing to say. But what he was trying to communicate is that I'm bigger than your problem. <laughs> just hold on. Put your seat buckle, on, seat buckle on. We're about to see something marvelous here. So 
says, don't cry. And what he's trying to say is that I'm bigger than your problem. And many times we, we, we get stuck in that place of no anticipation, of, of a lack of faith, and we're focused on our problem, and we don't see the person who's standing in front of us saying, hey, I'm bigger than your problem. I'm bigger than your financial mountain. I'm bigger than the, the problems that you're having in your family. I'm bigger than that addiction. I'm bigger than the depression. I'm bigger than everything you're going through. I'm bigger than that doctor's report. Don't cry. And the only reason why this woman would have thought his words were ridiculous is because she didn't recognize who he was. See, the words of Jesus are ridiculous if we don't understand who he is and what he wants for our lives. If we're not, if we're not familiar with who he is, who he's revealed himself to be, the words are going to be ridiculous. We're going to be, that's not for me. I don't, I don't know about that. And verse 14 says, And he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So the reason why they stood, because it freaked them out. <laughs> they stood still because they freaked them, it totally freaked them out. Number one, they were he was touching a dead person. And according to their law, you shouldn't ever touch a dead person. They became ceremonial unclean. So that freaked them out. That was the beginning of being freaked out. Then all of a sudden... <laughs> Everything changed in their life. Everything changed right before them. There's one crowd saying, I think this guy has lost his mind. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? But then there's this other crowd that's filled with anticipation saying, you know what? I believe he can do anything. Something great is about to happen here. They had hearts full of expectancy about what God was going to do right before their eyes. And today there may be two different crowds that are here. A crowd in expectation about what God is going to do. And maybe another crowd that's frustrated about what God didn't do. And today I want to urge you to get out of that line of frustration and get into that line of anticipation about what God has been doing in your life, in the, in the lives of other people, what you've been seeing God do in people's lives. Say, God, I know if you've done it for them, you'll do it for me. Lord, I know if you did it then, you'll do it now. I know if you healed that person, you'll heal me. I know, Lord, if, if, if you bring, brought restoration to their family, you'll bring restoration to my family. I know because your word says that you are no respecter of persons. Number three, believe Jesus and share the good news. In verse 15, it says, So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented himself, presented him to his mother. You gotta kind of wonder, what did this guy say? <laughs> so he, he began to speak. What was he talking about when he when he when he when he when he sat up? You gotta kind of wonder. It's kind of a crazy thing. You're at a you're at a funeral, someone sits up and begins to speak. The funeral's over. Everyone's going home. <laughs> wonder if he said something like this, but the last thing I remember saying was, hey, guys, watch this, as he's doing something crazy, you know? <laughs> then it says in verse 16, then fear came upon them all. This word fear means awe, awe. They were in awe of what happened. Then, great, then awe or fear came upon them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And in this situation, when they saw this miracle happen, they saw God resurrect this dead situation and bring it to life, both the frustrated crowd and the anticipated crowd, both of them began to glorify God. The Christians were saying, I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's amazing. The unbelievers and the skeptics were saying, what do I have to do to get saved? <laughs> See, I want a church that's, that, that, I want a church 
That when people walk in, they experience God, and a sense of awe comes among us all. In awe of what God is doing in his church, what God is doing in our lives. But that starts with us. How we position ourselves, the, the attitude, the perspective that we, that we have when we come to the house of the Lord. We come here to corporately gather. Are we coming here in awe of what God has been doing? Are we coming here in expectation of all that God is going to do? Or are we going to choose to remain frustrated, negative, pessimistic, skeptic? Or are we going to choose to operate in faith? God, what are you going to do today? And it says this in verse 17, And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding regions. In other words, they didn't get together and talk about what was happening to each other. <laughs> they weren't hanging around the church on Sundays and Wednesdays and even Fridays once a month, hanging around what, and talking about what God's been doing in their life. They were out there telling people. They're giving their testimony. They're being witnesses of what God has been doing in their life. They went out, and the people in all the surrounding regions heard about what God was doing in people's lives. It's about our testimony. Your testimony is the most effective means of evangelism that you have. What God is doing in your life and what God has been doing in your life is going to change other people's lives. It's going to be, what God is this? If God can do that for them, I wonder if God can do that for me. Many of us are saved because we heard someone else's testimony of how God changed their life. People want something that's real. There's enough religion out there. But people are looking for the real deal. And the mark of the real is real changed lives. It's not reading from a script. It's not saying all the right words or acting the right way. But changed life, lives are proof of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it might come up. We're going to close today. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did then, he'll still do now in our lives. And may we come to the Father, even in our prayer times, in our own times with him, and even, to, even as we corporately gather in church, may we come to him with expectation of all that he's going to do. Your faith will position you for what you can receive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your desire to move in hearts and lives. Lord, may we have hearts full of expectation, hearts, Lord, just full of anticipation about what you're going to do in this place. Lord, as we approach Easter, Lord, I come in great expectation of all that you're going to do. I'm, I'm coming with full expectation, Lord, of the changed lives and the people, Lord, who will be coming into this place, Lord, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing, Lord, that lives will be saved and lives changed and lives saved for your glory. Maybe you're here today and you haven't experienced Jesus Christ for yourself. You've never made a commitment to follow him. I want to give you that opportunity. Jesus did very, some, some marvelous things while he was here on the earth. He did some powerful things, but the most powerful thing that he did was what he did on the cross. That was the greatest miracle that ever took place when God sent his son Jesus to redeem mankind who was lost in their sin. They were dead in their sin. And he looked down the corridor of time and made a plan to redeem you and me. He saw you from the foundations of the world. He saw the choices that you would make. And he made a plan for redemption. 
He saw you walking towards an eternity in hell, separated from him forever. But he made a plan for you to spend eternity with him in heaven. Everybody's potential is to be saved. The Bible says that not, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm asking you today, will you live in your potential? Will you make a choice to follow him? Will you make the decision to follow Jesus Christ? Not everybody lives up to that potential. Not everybody walks in that potential. But it's available for you and it's available for me. And Jesus Christ, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. He walked a sinless and perfect life. And he died on that cross to pay for your sin and for mine. All of your sin, all your shame, all of your hurt, he bore on that cross so that you wouldn't have to pay for your sin. He paid a price that you couldn't pay. He paid a debt that, that he didn't owe. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And the Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And today I'm asking you, will you place your faith and trust in him? And pray like this, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Make me clean. Make me new. Empower me by your grace to, to live the life you've called me, to, to, that you have available for me, free from sin, free from the works of the enemy on my life. And if you'll call out to him, he'll save you. Maybe there's some here today, you are far from God. You feel like you're backslidden, you're far from him. You've walked away from him and you want to restore your relationship with him today. You say, God, I'm coming back. I want to, I want to get right with you again. If that's you, if any of those two apply for you today, would you raise your hand right now? Yes. Yes. Would you stand with us? And we're going to worship him as we dismiss today. And today, if you're needing prayer, today, if you raised your hand, if you want to make a commitment to Christ, if you're rededicating your life to Christ, I want you to come forward. I want you to make that commitment up front. The Bible says that if you're ashamed before men, he'll be ashamed of you before his angels in heaven. He wants you to make a commitment. He wants you to make it public. And if that's you, I want you to come forward. Today, if you need prayer in any area of your life, I want you to come forward as well. Let's come. Let's worship him. To die for us on the cross, we thank you for that price that he paid. And today, Lord, we give our lives to you. We have reaffirmed that commitment, Lord, the work of salvation that you've done in our lives. And because of that, we praise you. We worship you. We thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross. We thank you for the price that was paid for us. We thank you that three days later you rose from the dead, that resurrection power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And you said in your word that that, that same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us and it shall quicken our mortal bodies. So Father, today I speak your blessing over every individual here. And may we leave this place in your power. May we leave this place in your peace and with joy unspeakable, full of glory. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us today.